Welcome to episode 108. There is no better time than right now to plan your vacation getaway. Don't have the time to plan? Use the friendly travel agents at 3D Travel Company by going to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and clicking the Book Now button today on the left-hand side. Hurry and plan your trip today so you can travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest is the voice of Reed Richards, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic from Fantastic Four, World's Greatest Heroes. Stay tuned for a clip and then an amazing interview with today's special guest. Iron Man, I presume. Welcome to Stark Enterprises. You're just as arrogant as Stark. It must be something he values in his employees. We can't just let him go, Reed. Of course not. No doubt Doom is expecting both Iron Man and us. And while Stark's Iron Man armor is quite capable, no one knows Doom better than we do. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am super excited to be bringing you an interview with Hiro Kanagawa. Thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time today, Hiro. My pleasure. Uh, what can I do for you today? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about voiceover and acting in general. Um, you know, the very first thing I love to do when I have a guest on the show, especially for the first time, Hero, is get to know them. So tell me about the little boy Hero who grew up into the man he is today, and how did he get into acting and uh, voice acting and screen acting, everything that you've done? Uh, you know, I was born in Japan, and when I was uh, around three, my family moved to North America, and I grew up in uh Guelph, Ontario, and Sterling Heights, Michigan. And then when I was 14, we moved back to Japan. I went to high school there, and uh, and then I went to uh, college in the States. And I've been all around, but I started acting uh, probably in high school. I did some student films and some student plays, and uh, that's mainly how I got into it. Uh, you know, and then uh, in college, I was not... Uh, a theater major. I was a v visual arts okay. major. I was a sculptor back in those days. Nice. Um, but I did I did perform in student plays uh, in college, and uh, I also um, made made some short films of my own. And I've always been involved in the arts, and in, in uh, and especially the performing arts, in in one aspect or another. When I moved to Vancouver. Uh, in the early 90s, um, it all kind of sort of came together professionally. And uh, my career as an actor really has developed along with the film industry here in Vancouver. We've kind of grown up together in a way. Voice is not something that I uh, pursued specifically, but uh, once I had established myself to some extent as a as a film and television actor, I started to get offers for voice work, uh, primarily for um, doing some uh, overdubs of previously produced uh, shows from Japan, you know, Japanese anime shows. Yes. Yeah. But uh, And then along the way, I, I started to pick up some prelay work. Uh, most notably, the, the largest roles I've had are... Um, the Foolish Magistrate on a children's show called Sagwa, the Siamese, the Chinese Siamese cat, was based on a story by Amy Tan, and uh, and then of course uh, Reed Richards, Mister Fantastic. Absolutely. on the Marvel series. <laughs> Absolutely. And Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic is one of my favorite act, you know, characters. Uh, and so when I was researching, you know, your background and stuff, uh, I was like, holy cow, I loved that show. And I owned, uh, I own the box set actually. And so I was like, this is totally fantastic because you are a fantastic actor hero. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, you did play Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic on uh, Fantastic Four World's Greatest Heroes. Uh, and you were on mm -hmm. um, 
you were on that show with some actors who I've previously had on the show. Sam Vincent, who played Herbie, your computer, uh, kind of like Iron Man's Jarvis. Uh, and then I've had uh -huh. David Kay on the show, who played Iron Man. And uh, Andrew uh -huh. Kovatis, who was Bruce Banner, the alter ego of Hulk. Uh, so it's really cool that, uh, you know, I'm finally getting you on the show because having the leader of the team is super important. <laughs> Well, that's you know Sam, Sam Vincent, and David Kay. I've uh, I know them very well. I've known them for years and years. David Kay, we just connected. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned we just connected a couple a couple of days ago on Facebook. Fantastic. After you know losing touch for many years, and uh, I recall he was in an X an X Files episode that I was in, season two of X Files. Oh, wow. Firewalker. Yeah, we were in the same. Uh, so as I say, you know, we've grown up. We've grown up with the industry together. That was early days. Absolutely. And uh, Sam Vincent, I've, I see him around town, and I've been on a number of uh, animation things with him. But he's just uh, he's a hilarious uh, character. He is. He just does, you know, <laughs> he's always cracking us up in the recording studio. Well, Hero, tell me, what was it like for you to get to voice the leader of the Fantastic Four on a Marvel entity? You know, that was obviously a tremendous privilege and honor, especially because Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, is such an iconic character. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and I think it's it was uh, doubly significant and great for me being an Asian, someone of Asian ancestry, to get to voice, uh, you know, a character a Caucasian character who is so well-known and iconic. I thought that was uh, significant. And, uh, you know, and, and it was, uh, you know, I was proud of that. I think that was actually fantastic. I am really glad that they did cast you as Reed Richards. Um, your voice just comes across so crisp and clean. I mean, you're an actor that I've seen, like you've said, you've grown up with the acting industry in Canada. And I feel like I've grown up with you through all the shows that I've loved over the years. You know, you're there in, in almost everything. It seems like that I've loved through my lifetime. So it's fantastic that you got to play Reed Richards. I think it was a wonderful casting and you bring such an awesome aspect to uh, Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards that I think is superb when they cast you they definitely knew what they were doing thanks for saying I appreciate it uh, you know when when I auditioned for that part I had no idea that uh, that, that I would be considered ser seriously I mean I think the thinking back I think the original audition breakdown said something like think a young George Clooney <laughs> that's funny that's funny. Something like that. Uh, so they definitely envisioned the character being uh, pretty suave. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I recall my my voice, I think, naturally has a bit of a gravel in it. So uh, I was conscious of taking that out and uh, making the character a little bit younger than I was at the time and certainly a lot younger than I am now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But other than that, it, it was, I think, pretty close to my natural speaking voice. Yeah. Um, but with animation, obviously, there's always, um, you know, you have to add about 100% more energy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You ordinarily would speaking. Even if it seems naturalistic, there's just so much more energy involved when you're in the recording studio. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, speaking of superheroes, Hero, what is your favorite superhero? That's an interesting question. I would have to go with, hmm, I might have to go with Batman. Okay. Insofar as he doesn't actually have superpowers. True, yeah. Uh, he's just a regular human being who uh, is able to, through, through his technology and his wits and his training, able to uh, compete in that superhero universe. Uh, I think for that reason, he's to me he's more relatable than uh, than 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 a superhero like let's say Spider Man who has you know altered DNA. Yeah, yeah. Or or even Superman who's from another planet. Although Superman maybe would be a close second because I think um, as an immigrant to planet Earth and as a kind of a fish out of water, I think a lot of people can relate to that 
that part of Superman's identity. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely see that. Uh, well, that's awesome. I'm glad it's Batman. He's actually it is kind of a hard toss up sometimes. I think Batman and Iron Man are my favorite, but they're both kind of uh -huh. that same, you know, regular guy, no superpowers, but they use their wits and their money to kind of help them in their arsenal to fight crime. So I love that. Right. Yes, I agree. <laughs> well, hero, here's another question hero related. If you could choose to be any hero, who would it be? Like an existing hero? Anything. Or, I mean, you could make one up. Or it could be... If I had, I had a superpower. If you had three superpowers, what would they be? I have always uh, wished I had the he the power of healing. Okay. Uh, I don't know that there is a superhero out there who that's his super that's his or her superpower. Not that I really but think of. Yeah. I guess it's not the most exciting superpower, but I've often wished that I had that power. You know. Yeah. When you see people in chronic pain or after an injury or you hear, of, you know, things on the news that just break your heart. And I just wish I could heal some people. Uh, I wish I had that power for sure. If we're talking about uh, more conventional superpowers, um, I think certainly, uh, you know, the strength. Yeah. The strength. You know, I, time travel. uh there, man, there's so many superpowers. I mean, any <laughs> I know, really right? any superpower would be would be pretty fantastic, really, if you think about it. Absolutely, but, yeah. But really, the one that really has always resonated with me is that power of healing. Absolutely. Well, you know something, hero. I think you do have the power to heal because actors have the power to make people laugh and smile, and that is the best medicine. So I believe you truly are a healer through what you do, and actors make the world a better place. And I think through the career choice that you've chosen and, and been a part of, I think you do bring healing to others through your career and the acting that you've done and, and the shows that you've done and brought us laughter and, and uh, wonderful drama and just whatever you do, you bring smiles to people's face because you're an excellent actor, man. Well, thank you. That's very generous of you. I mean, I think that that is a very generous view of the acting profession. I know that um, we can often come across as being spoiled and uh, self-involved divas. But uh, I think, as you say, at root, all of us, when we first uh, entered into this, into this profession, I, I won't say all of us, but I think Many young actors, when they first enter into the profession, they enter into it with precisely the kind of aspirations that you've just mentioned. I don't think, well, nowadays I'm not sure, but certainly when I was coming up, uh, most young actors that I knew, they weren't thinking about being famous or being celebrities. They were, you know, they were... Uh, they were dedicated to to a craft and learning a craft and and as you say trying to figure out how to use their creativity and their art to inspire and and entertain people absolutely and to, yeah. and to explore something about the human condition absolutely i think that is dead on hero and uh I'm just so glad we've gotten to talk about some of these things. You know, hero related, this kind of throws in, um, you know, with you talking about growing up with the uh, entertainment industry up there uh, in Canada, you know, uh, what has it been like to be a part of so many amazing shows from the CW, such as Smallville, Arrow, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, and The 100, just to name a few. Um, you know, you've played on so many different hero shows, whether it be animated or uh, live action TV or films such as Elektra. Uh, you know, so it's been amazing that you've been a part of so many DC and Marvel entities. What has it been like for you to be a part of these universes uh, time and time again? It's been a real pleasure. Uh, as a, I think, you know, a part of me has never grown up from, <laughs> from being a kid. Yeah. And uh, as a kid... Those were stories, those were comics, graphic novels uh, that I enjoyed and, and uh, you know, fantasized about being a part of. And so as a grown adult, to actually be a part of those, those worlds is uh, it's kind of a dream come true. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, as someone with a visual arts background, uh, it's always a huge thrill for me especially 
given the production values nowadays, to walk on to some of these sets and, and see firsthand what the set deck people have come up with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> to see the costumes, to see the, the sets, to see the, some of the action sequences and how they're filmed and so on. So that aspect of it has definitely been, uh, a real thrill for me. Of course, as, as, uh, the, the type of career that I've had, I have not had the privilege of, being with one show, let's say, for multiple number of years. Yeah. And that is something that at times I have uh, wished I had more job security in that sense, you know? I understand, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but you know, looking back now, uh, I can't say that I, that I regret having had the opportunity to jump from show to show and, uh, and get to see all of these different worlds. Um, you know, if I was attached to one show for a long time, I don't know that I would have uh, had that opportunity. And I've and I've met, you know, so many actors who have been attached to a franchise for a long time. And and then, you know, as as much as we love our work and as rewarding as it is, when you're attached to something for seven or eight years, it gets old. Yeah. And then sometimes it's also hard for people to see you as anything else after that, you know? That's right. That's, that is a, another, uh, definite, definite, uh, kind of setback yeah. that some actors have. And, um, and it is, it's hard to, uh, to stay motivated sometimes. So I've, I'm, I'm very lucky and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm very glad that I've had this, the career that I've had being able to, uh, to move from one thing to another. Uh, and my personality is really kind of suited to that, you know, a project based kind of existence. Yeah. Yeah. Move one project, finish that, move on to the next project. It keeps things, uh, fresh for me. And, uh, that's the way I like it. Absolutely. Although my kids are getting older now and more expensive. So <laughs> uh, I think I need to move into a little bit more of a secure job situation. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, we'll pray that that happens for you in the days ahead. Maybe, uh, they'll pull you on at DC legends full time as uh, director Bennett, maybe, or something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, just so people know, cause uh, we didn't mention the names you played principal Kwan on six episodes mm-hmm. in Smallville. You were Dr. Lamb in two episodes of arrow and uh, Dr. Bennett, three episodes so far on DC's legends of tomorrow. Uh, all of those shows, uh, except for Smallville right now are still running. Uh, so maybe arrow or DC legends could bring you back. Um, but you've also been on the 100. Uh, you were a character just named council member number three, but you were on four episodes of that. That was an amazing show. I'm really, I can't wait for this next season that's going to be coming out uh, here in a, uh, about 60 days, I think, or so. But, you know, the the one thing is I've just started introducing my wife, Hero, to Smallville for the very first time. She's really into Arrow and Legends and Flash and, and Supergirl and all that going on right now on, on uh, CW. But she's never partaken in Smallville. And we are just now in the middle of uh, season two. Unfortunately, your character did uh, get killed off in the end of season one and we were sad about that and she was like (laughs) oh she's like I liked Principal Kwan so you know it's really fun for me to uh, experience this already being a fan of Smallville seeing all 10 seasons uh, and introducing my wife so she was really excited to hear we were going to be doing an interview today okay good absolutely that's great too great to hear Absolutely. Well, you know, speaking of some other TV shows of note, these aren't necessarily CW related. Uh, Some shows that I've absolutely loved you on were Almost Human. Uh, Of course, you mentioned the X-Files earlier. Timeless Sliders, one of my absolute favorite of all times. The Outer Limits, Stargate SG-1, another all-time favorite. Uh, And of course, Heroes Reborn. We're visiting Heroes again, (laughs) where you played Mm. Hachiro Otomo on eight episodes of that series. That was a fantastic reboot of, of heroes, the original series. Uh, and it was awesome to get to see you be a part of that. What was it like to be on heroes and some of those other great shows we talked about? Yeah. Heroes was, a uh, that was a little bit different for me because it was shot in Toronto. And, uh, so that involved quite a bit of travel for me. They would, uh, and because uh, I, I can't remember exactly what the deal was, but it might have been I was concurrently shooting Man in the High Castle in Vancouver that fall, I believe. 
So they couldn't just uh, keep me in Toronto for the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it, it literally involved me flying out to Toronto on, say, a Monday or a Tuesday, and then shooting that week, and then flying back home Friday. Wow. So, uh, you know, it was a lot of travel, but uh, on the other hand, I got to be with my kids, my family during the weekend. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was, it was actually a great experience. Uh, I probably wound up making something like 12 trips to Toronto (laughs) (laughs) in like 12 uh, weeks (laughs) during like the, yeah, during like the, uh, three or four months that, uh, I was on that show. Uh, I made a lot of, I, I, I made a lot of great connections on that show. Um, James, that's when I first met James Middleton, who, uh, is one of the producers of, uh, altered carbon. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. And some of the, uh, actors on that show, Toru Chikado, uh, most notably, I'm still in touch with him. We're hoping to work together on, on something upcoming. Oh, uh, cool! But it was a great, yeah, it was a great experience. That's Absolutely. fantastic. Well, I mean, all the shows we've talked about so far, Hero, you've worked with amazing stellar casts and crews and directors and producers. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and the opportunity you've had, although you haven't been tied down to just one show as a as a mainstay character, you've had, like you said, such an opportunity to uh, to mingle and to meet people in your industry, uh, you know, that you probably would have never gotten had you been just set on one show for a while, you know, for several years. So it, I'm sure it's been really helpful to you in your career has just I think it really has exploded Uh, as we get into the last two things we're really going to talk about today the man in the high castle and of course Netflix's altered carbon which has exploded on the internet it's exploded everywhere like everybody's talking about it and uh, I blew through it and was like where when is season two coming out because it was just so amazing and visually stunning Uh, but before we get there I want to talk about the man in the high castle because It also blew my mind away because I've always been one of those what if kind of guys like what if uh, the Americans lost World War Two, you know, like what would our world have been like this show is like Mm -hmm. my dreams and my envisioning of the world that could have been. And it like blows my mind away with the things I've dreamed up as a kid, uh, how they came up with the show. I I will never know. But you've played on that show uh, in five different episodes. Uh, And what has it been like for you to be part of such an amazing show? Uh, I believe it's the one that airs on Amazon, I believe. Is that right? That's right. It's 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 an Amazon Prime series. That's what I thought. Yeah. And uh, yes. And as you say, that is uh, a tremendous universe. I was, uh, and it's based on a Philip K. Dick novel. Okay. Who, uh, and and I'm sure, you know, Philip K. Dick obviously is the man who, you know, Blade Runner yeah. is yeah. based on another of his novels. Uh, I believe, I believe the original title of that novel was Do Electric, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? <laughs> I'm, I might be mistaken, but I think that that is the uh, original title of the novel that Blade Runner is based on. But uh, Man in the High Castle, yes, it's uh, it's another Philip K. Dick novel that was adapted. And uh, as you say, it's just uh, it was a fascinating look into an alternative future of what might have been had the Nazis and the Japanese won World War II. And, uh, uh, you know, as we get into talking about these uh, more recent shows, I think the thing that we really have to talk about is how the production values for these series have really exploded. Um, Not so much on the network shows, but for these uh, specialty channels and for the streaming. Absolutely, yeah. For the streaming providers like Amazon and Netflix, uh, the production values are are really approaching feature film level. Yeah. Uh, They they have the money and they're bringing in um, top flight directors, actors, producers, writers, uh, and they're able to because uh, I think everyone recognizes that that, that that the quality work is now happening in this medium of serial narratives, you know. I mean, it's the golden age of the serial narrative. And, um, and so, you know, my first impression of Man in the High Castle was, wow, what incredible production values, once Absolutely. again, just yeah. walking on... Uh, my first taste of that was just uh, the first wardrobe fitting. <laughs> the attention to detail, you know, 
it's not uncommon to go in for a wardrobe fitting for a TV show, and you're in and out in less than half an hour. Yeah. You try on a few shirts, you try on a few uh, suits, and bingo, bango, you're out. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with shows like Man in the High Castle, Altered Carbon, and some others I've done recently for these streaming providers, the production values are so high, and the ward the wardrobe fitting, the attention to detail is like on a feature film. Wow. So that was my uh, first taste of it, and then the first cast reading when I saw, you know, the cast walking on set, seeing the production values of the sets, and uh, just you know, walking through the production office and seeing all of the... Uh, the design concepts and you, you immediately get a sense of, well, this is, uh, this is going to visually be something special, something stunning. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was my, uh, experience working on that show. Uh, I met a very, my character, I think met a very untimely end, an yeah. abrupt and untimely end. I think I'm guessing, but it may have had something to do with uh, the change in showrunner that happened midway through the second season. You may have heard Frank Spotsnitz, Spotnitz, who was the original showrunner. He uh, he parted ways with the show midway through uh, the second season. Yeah. And then yep. they kind of went on hiatus to figure out what to do. And then, you know, it was right after they came back from hiatus that... Uh, the episode came out and I was, you know, killed off. Yeah. Um, it did seem kind of abrupt. It did. I don't know that that was an original plan at the start of the season because when I went into the wardrobe fitting at the beginning of the season, there were actually some wardrobe pieces that uh, suggested there was going to be, you know, a lot more happening for that character. Yeah. So that's that's a... That's kind of a regret of mine, uh, but uh, what what can I do? You know. Yeah, yeah. It is what it is, and that happened. And uh, the producers were very actually very kind enough to uh, to phone me up uh, beforehand and explain the situation. And uh, they were, you know, explain that they didn't really want to kill me off, but uh, the way the story was going, that's what they had to do. So. I don't have any bad feelings about that. You know, but with all the time travel stuff and the alternate like world things going on, maybe you'll pop up in the other world sometime. <laughs> well, that's uh, it's that's been suggested. I mean, I think that when you watch the show, uh, I get the sense that you actually do have to die to show up in Minister Tagomi's alternate universe. Okay. Okay. You know, I think that's. I may be wrong, but uh, the sense that I get is that. Only characters who have died in in the you know quote unquote real world yeah. get to show up later on in Tagomi's alternate universe. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea what what, what will become of the Yakuza boss. So, well, if you come back, I would be super excited. Um, well, so would I. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I know I've already seen a preview for season three, uh, and they're talking mm -hmm. about the Nazis are talking about building a machine that can get them from world to world, uh, like different right. universes or whatever there it actually is. And so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. like, if that's true, maybe we'll see again. That would be awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. but um, anyway, we're definitely going to dive into altered carbon now. Um, it, mm -hmm. it's super amazing visually. And like you said, the sets are amazing, the costumes, everything. Uh, and I know this is the first show, um, uh, shot in 8k and it's just visually pops. It's, it's so stunning and it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Absolutely. Uh, I think for all of those reasons you've mentioned that, you know, that is one of the reasons why it has, uh, has so much buzz about it. The last you know, two weeks since it, since it dropped. Uh, it's just, uh, I, from the scripts to the, the cast that was assembled, everything about it is just, uh, you know, a list. And, uh, I'm just super thrilled to have been a part of it. Absolutely. Well, it's amazing to see how your career has literally exploded hero. I mean, you're in everything now. It seems like I can't watch anything anymore without seeing you. And I love it. <laughs> well, you know, I got to keep the kids fed uh 
having said that, uh, I am at a point where I do have to be more choosy and uh, try not to get overexposed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and try not to get typecast as a, for instance, a detective or a hard ass authority figure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Altered Carbon has definitely uh, given me a lot more exposure. And uh, I'm I'm kind of at a crossroads in my career now where I got to uh, I have to obviously take advantage of that, but I got to be careful about my next move and uh, make sure that uh, I keep my uh, options open as an actor, as a, as opposed to getting uh, pigeonholed into something or or attached to something that you know not necessarily uh, going to sustain my interest over the long term. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Hero, do you know if we can expect to see a season two of Altered Carbon, or can you say? I'm not privy to all the details, but I do know that uh, I do know that that there are some scripts being developed. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I also know from, and this is from uh, things I've read, uh, and as well as uh, some conversations that I've had with uh, one of the producers. It is, and a season two of Altered Carbon may not involve anyone in season one. Okay. Uh, the reason being, uh, there are three books, right? Okay. And yeah. each book actually takes place on a completely different world. So uh, if they are following a tra the trajectory of the books, which I believe they are, then season two of Altered Carbon will take place on a completely different world, many, many years separated from season one. Okay. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very likely that uh, the cast will be you know, predominantly very different from the cast of, of season one. Oh, okay, okay. That's my understanding at this point anyways. Well, I'm not very familiar with the books that have spawned Altered Carbon, the show, but, um, you know, I've definitely heard that they were, they had come from a book, but I'm more of a visual person than a reader myself. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, anyway, I'm just so glad you got to be a part of it and it has been such a buzz. I mean, since it hit Netflix two weeks ago, uh, I mean, it's all, it seems like anybody's talking about right now. So, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and I think that's understandable just, uh, from, the visual impact, but also uh, the dystopian storyline and uh, the references. It references, uh, obviously, other science fiction archetypes. Uh, a lot of people compare it, for instance, to Blade Runner. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so there's, there's definitely a built-in audience for it. But uh, I think that aside from that, uh, like all not all, but like many dystopian stories, it has something to say uh, that's relevant about our current social condition. And, uh, and I think that for those reasons, uh, it goes beyond a mere entertainment. And I, and I think that audiences uh, are finding many reasons to find the show compelling beyond the eye candy let's say, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I love that Netflix and Amazon Prime and all these companies are finally able to produce stuff, like you said, at such a high quality all around. Um, you know, I'm starting to see these shows come out that I'm like, this is better than anything I can go see in the theater almost. You know, I mean, they've gotten to a point where they're, they're almost surpassing feature films, I feel, in some aspects, because they don't have the limitations that films have that have to go to theaters and DVD and that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, I think that uh, the the business model in the entertainment industry is uh, is is really in flux. It's uh, and it's pretty astonishing to think that you know a handful of years ago the the bulk of my income would have come from the traditional models, you know, network shows, let's say, and and uh, studio films, and. The last two years, and especially, yes, but the last two years, I would say the bulk of my income now is coming from streaming providers. Wow, that's insane. Like Netflix, <laughs> like Amazon, and specialty channels on cable. And and it's it's crazy to think that 
it's not that long ago that Netflix was this company that mailed you DVDs. <laughs> yeah. Or they were the company that had all the other movies that were already out on their system, but they didn't have anything new or, or just Netflix based content. Um, but it's amazing because they've been able to pick up shows that have either uh, been canceled. Like um, uh, what is it? Family. Oh gosh. I'm totally blanking out on it. But, you know, they're picking up shows that have either been canceled or whatever, and they're bringing them to Netflix and continuing. And then the fans are going nuts because now it's not just bringing old content for us to rewatch again and again, but they're bringing us new stuff. And it's just it's stellar. Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's well, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we got to keep got to stay on my toes to uh, <laughs> as the industry keeps changing. Yeah, I bet. I bet you do. Hero, I have two final questions for you, and we will wrap this interview up. The first of the two is, what kind of advice would you give to a young aspiring actress or actor, uh, or maybe somebody who's already kind of started in the field, but they aren't sure where to head, maybe what kind of direction to start their career? That's a, that's a tough one. I think the uh, industry is very different, even from when I started out. Yeah. Um, there's just so much uh, more chatter more white noise out there with social media and uh, and everything. Uh, but I think at root, being an actor really is the same. You, you do need that core uh, training. And, uh, and aside from, you know, aside from that, if you ask 10 actors who've had sustained careers, how they managed to do it, how they got to where they got, you will get 10 different answers. Uh, there's no one path. There's no magic technique or method. Uh, everybody has to find their own way. Yeah. Uh, and, and my way wouldn't necessarily be right for someone else. Everyone also, you know, you have to keep in mind, every actor fits into a different demographic. Yeah. In my case, I mean, I'm obviously a visible minority of Asian ancestry. And so the, my challenges and uh, my advantages are not going to be the same as, you know, a kid from Nebraska. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, so, uh, an all-American kid from, from Nebraska or, or an African-American actor or a Latino actor. Everyone has their own uh, disadvantages and advantages in this industry, and uh, everyone's got to find their own path. So I don't know... Uh, that, that any ad advice that I could give would be relevant to everyone other than to say that, yes, you do need to train and uh, you do need to have that passion and that uh, creativity to, uh, to, you know, inspire people and, uh, and entertain as we talked about early on in this, in this interview. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think that's great advice, Hero. And, um, you know, everybody needs to start with the basics and uh, work from there because every journey is a little bit different. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the last and final question I have for you today, Hero, is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? The legacy? Yes, sir. I, uh, I have not even started to think about that. Okay. I'm still aspiring. Uh, I, I don't feel that uh, I'm anywhere near the end or the, you know, I don't even feel like I'm, I'm at the tail end of a career. I think I'm still aspiring to uh, get to the next level. Absolutely. And uh, as, I, as I said, you know, my, my life has been involved in the arts in one aspect or another for my entire adult days. So uh, I'm all about creating meaningful art and uh and film and television is not always about that but uh i'm definitely interested in creating work that has artistic merit and is going to uh is, is going to have a long life beyond uh the 15 minutes of 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 uh fame or the news cycle or uh what's hot now and you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah um yeah. i'm hope hopefully years from now when uh i hang it up i will have a body of work that i can be proud of and that uh 
has uh, withstood the, the the test of time. Absolutely. I think so. I mean, it's a, it's like everyone's talking about altered carbon two weeks after it dropped, but will they still be talking about it like this in 250 years? <laughs> well, that's exactly, yeah, exactly uh, my point. Absolutely. We want to, I think as artists, we all want to create work that will live on and continue to inspire people uh, generation after generation. Absolutely. I think that is uh, an absolutely great and wonderful legacy that you want to leave behind, Hero. And I cannot thank you enough for the time we've had today. Oh, it was my pleasure entirely. Well, Hero, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Would you please give us a special closeout today as Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four? Hi, fans. This is Reed Richards. I've had a fantastic time here on Who Did That Voice? This has been Hero Kanagawa. It's been my absolute pleasure. Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's episode with Hiro Kanagawa, the voice of Mr. Fantastic, and so much more. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice? I would love to hear from you. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us next time for our special guest, Keith Coogan, the voice of young Todd from Disney's The Fox and the Hound. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they've voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.